have only ever acted to avenge crimes against my people. The Master of Magnetism is a man of many names. Eric Lenscher, Magnus, of course, Magneto. But it all begins with the very first one. The one that has dominated his entire existence. The one that fuels his every action and idea. Magneto Testament expands on that identity and focuses on the horror that makes the man. That identity is of a Jewish boy, Max Eisenhardt, who had to endure some of the most brutal conditions imaginable as a Jewish teenager in Germany in the 1940s. This video is sponsored by Aura. Data brokers sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your relatives, it's all out there. For me, the most unsettling parts of having my information exposed is seeing how much of my history can be so easily traced. It's uncomfortable. It makes me wonder what other information might be out there, and who might have it. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information, and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information not only reduces the amount of spam that I get, but it also protects me from hackers who could use this information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, or other sensitive information. Earlier this year, AT&T revealed that over 72 million customer records, both existing and former customers, were, were released on the dark web. They recommend those affected use strong passwords, monitor account activity, and consider credit freezes or fraud alerts from credit bureaus. Aura does all of this for me, and I don't have to download several different apps just because a company couldn't keep my data secure. Aura is always on, always doing the hard work of keeping people safe. So if you are interested, you can go to aura.com slash sagesreign to start your two-week free trial. Again, that's aura.com slash sagesreign to start your two-week free trial. Bullied at school, followed by their homes, businesses, and places of worship, bombed and 30,000 of his own people were sent to concentration camps. His family is then forced to flee to Poland, where thousands more are systematically starved to death. As they try to escape once more, his family is caught as he stands utterly helpless, watching his family get executed in front of him. Max survives and is then forced to watch thousands of children, men and women, walk to their deaths, his own people. By the end, he had seen a quarter million dead human beings with his own eyes, and he couldn't save a single one, any more than they could save him. Magneto Testament chronicles exactly why Max Eisenhardt is Magneto's most important identity, and it also pinpoints exactly when that identity was left behind. It was buried along with his parents and his sister. He relearned how to live again, how to laugh. He married his childhood crush, Magda, and when their first daughter, Anya, was born, it seemed like life was now something worth living, that his survival was truly worth it. But his powers wouldn't develop until later on in his adulthood. Fatal Attraction and X-Men 1991 write that the conditions that Max grew up with slowed the natural maturation of his mutant powers. Powers that only emerged the morning his home caught fire. These were powers that he could not control at the time, and as he tried to save his daughter from the fire, he was arrested by the very same men that caught wind of his powers emerging. Powers that, quote, sprung savagely from his chest in his moment of darkest despair as he held Anya in his arms. His rage that followed seemed to be a culmination of all of his anger from his days back in the concentration camps, and all for the injustices that he and his family faced as he killed the men and the town that stopped him from saving his daughter. Not only did Magneto feel rage, but he felt immense guilt also, that these powers were dormant inside of him and he could do nothing to save his family, to save his people when the time called for it in Nazi Germany. Master of magnetism, and yet he couldn't save his only child. These same powers drove Magda away out of fear. Now Eric Lenscher was all alone, left with his hatred. Nonetheless, Magneto found a cause greater than himself. Mankind's freedom, and in some cases, their ascendants. But rooting Magneto's character and his beliefs in real-world oppression like anti-Semitism grounds the character and gives him something real and tangible to believe in. You can immediately understand and connect to his personal struggle and the battle that he carries about his identity. You understand the rage, the helplessness, the pain. 
Not only does being a Jewish survivor inform his trauma and his fear, but it is also incredibly important when it comes to his willingness to do good, because it informs his compassion and his empathy as well. Shedding his one-dimensional characterization, Claremont's Magneto believed in becoming the world's sole leader, along with mutants ruling the earth, and in doing so, he would eradicate war, hunger, and poverty. Magneto often carves out this path out of fear and or anger, citing that he has seen humanity at its worst, and now with mutant kind, he seeks to rescue out his people. If others must suffer in doing so, then so be it. But Magneto defends his actions by saying that he was pushed to this limit. He goes too far because he knows what could happen if he doesn't. In Uncanny X-Men 161, where Charles and Magnus meet for the first time, the pair argue about humanity. Magneto calls him an idealistic fool for having faith in the essential goodness of man. And Magneto has always been right about one thing, and that's humanity's ability and propensity to hate. Magneto has always been right about humanity's ability to abandon what makes them human and become monsters. But Magneto's goal is so that mutants do not go meekly into the gas chambers, he recites in this comic. People are always quick to judge violent actions by the oppressed, but often fail to ask the question, what exactly pushed them to that point? Magneto is a man riddled with paranoia and fear, a man constantly on the defensive, anticipating an attack, so he never, ever lets his guard down. He so badly wants to be ready in case anything should happen again. A man who is so scarred by his past that he wants to make sure that he will never be a victim again. He will never be afraid to retaliate again. He's lived with that shame and that humiliation. Magneto let his guard down once and mankind destroyed 16 million on Genosha, the home that he built, the place that he was supposed to protect. He knows that no matter how good you are, no matter how safe your powers are, even if you never harm a single hair on a human's head, humanity will fear whatever is different, whatever they do not understand. And no matter what, they will always, always strike first. Their fear is inherently more dangerous than yours, because they can attack without consequence. Magneto has taken the burden of being the consequence for attacking mutant kind. At the same time, the other truth is that he is blinded by vengeance. He sometimes uses the guise of protection of mutants to hide behind his feelings of superiority and most of all, his rage. Sometimes he doesn't have mutant kind's best interests at heart. And sometimes he just wants to take down the people that have hurt him. And innocent mutants and humans are caught in the crossfire. That goes against his own ideals and goals. Magneto's beliefs were right, they were always right. But his actions, not so much. Just like Xavier, Magneto loses sight of his own goals. Magneto's design is sometimes drawn with that entity-like quality, a force larger than life, a shadow-like figure with the outline of his iconic mask being the focal point of his design, a character sometimes drawn without the details of his face, just his helmet and those pure white eyes, eyes of a man who has lost his soul, eyes that were beyond inhuman, one man pointed out. In Fatal Attraction, Magneto is characterized as a force who feels that he has been spared from the sweet surrender, the cold embrace that is death again and again. His survivor's guilt is rampant, and because of that, he is described as a man searching for what all of his suffering means, and thus a god or savior complex starts to develop. Magneto, in all of these depictions, almost always has an air of righteousness about him, arrogance, in the way that he speaks, in the way that he carries himself, he has a flair for the dramatic. It's almost Shakespearean in some depictions. He always has the coolest lines. I always think back to House of X when he tells the people, you have new gods now. Or more recently, all of his monologues in X-Men 97 are so moving. This is a big part of what makes Magneto, the aura. Charles can appeal to people's humanity and hope for their future like no one else can. But Eric, as an orator and a leader, has a different level of charisma. Add on the omega level power that he wields, and you create a man who is larger than life. You begin to believe that he can do anything. It's written time and again that Magneto's greatest strength is not his mutant ability, but his willpower. A core of his character that was so strong that he initially fought off Xavier's telepathy with it. A will stronger than most, if not all mutants. A will that is more than once called indomitable. 
When Xavier's son met Eric for the first time, he probed his brain and these memories, and he felt Eric's agony. Legion asked himself, how does Eric face it? How does he wake up in the morning to face yet another day? How does he live when there is a screaming emptiness inside of him? That is Magneto's sheer will to survive. In Fatal Attraction, these exact points are laid out. He was once genetically reverted to infancy and still found a way to regain his adulthood. What makes a man like that continue to believe in himself? It's written that he had a way of keeping those around him under his control, and not just through threat of physical punishment, but through sheer force of will. He believed so strongly in himself, in his goals, and his methods, that no matter how ludicrous they sounded, you actually believed he would accomplish them. So by staying with him, we were ensuring our place alongside greatness. How could any man repeatedly fail and still have the confidence and ego to continue to believe in himself? Either he's completely delusional or has an unshakable belief in the correctness of one's own ways. A man who believes that he is above the people of this world. Magneto desires to be a god because he does not want to be reminded of his humanity. He doesn't want to be reminded of the hurt that he's faced. A god wouldn't feel that pain. Magneto desires to be a god because he believed that God turned his back on his people. Magneto turned his back on God, on his faith, because he believed that he could save his people all by himself. But when this terrifying man is written as the Avenger of Munkind, you are met with one of the scariest and most imposing villains ever on a page or a screen. You then get Magneto the monster. His late wife Magda called him a monster after seeing his powers and the blood they spilled, and a monster is exactly what he became. More than that, it's how he viewed himself going forward. In some iterations, he associates the name, the identity of Magneto, with something that is not human. When the master of magnetism's daughter died in his arms, and his wife then left him, there was a moment when he had nothing to live for. One comic depicts this loss as the world losing one of its most valuable resources. Another writes that Magneto was a man who had no place to drop off his fear, his frustration, his rage, his pain. So he held all of these emotions in his heart until they ate at the man, until there was nothing left at all. The soul and heart of Eric Lenscher were replaced by the entity that is Magneto. In this world of mutants and superpowered individuals, the worst monster Magneto ever faced down was a human. And so Magneto adapted. To quote Armin, someone who can't sacrifice anything can never change anything. In order to rise above monsters, you must be willing to abandon even your own humanity to do so. In Bun's 2014 Magneto, that monster identity becomes a big part of this character. This run sinks Magneto deeper and deeper into his rage, into his lust for revenge. But in this story, he still has a sense of direction. This Magnus is the executioner of Mutantkind's fury, a cautionary tale for those who would continue to oppress others. He compares himself to the devil, a demon, a force for mutants. In this run, we follow a underpowered Magneto as he runs around killing those who have targeted mutants in any capacity. Both individuals and organizations were all fair game for Magneto. His rage was palpable in this story, not only to the reader, but to the characters inside this story. Legions of people come together and recite how they've been injured or have been caught in the crossfires of Magneto's storms of rage. But Tons are grateful as well. Mutant Kind's terrifying salvation. He accepts his role as a demon in the story because how could he be anything else? He encounters the very mutants, the very people that he is fighting for, and he is reminded constantly of the cruelty of man. But even in all of his rage, he can put his pride aside and put mutant kind first. Throughout the Messiah trilogy and Utopia, Magneto embraces a role as an enforcer, a true defender of mutant kind. And he later even becomes one of Cyclops' closest allies, freeing him from prison in the aftermath of the Avengers vs. X-Men conflict. And he later joins Cyclops' team and his cause. But for all the stories where Magneto is a righteous defender, there are the stories where Magneto becomes like the abusers and oppressors of his past. Whether it's creating Avalon or Asteroid M to wipe out humans off the planet, or seeking to rule the world, these stories happen because Magneto is a man trapped by his past. A man who sometimes fights to try and change what has already happened. 
a man who struggles to look forward. In Dark Seduction on Genosha, a depowered Magneto segregates humans and mutants, and makes emigration for humans illegal. He creates a precursor to an apartheid between the two species of man, the story writes. The oppressors become the oppressed. Magneto goes as far as trying to create a mutant army to try and fight against humans, and he sacrifices and manipulates his relationship with his children to try and do so. In this story, the three kids band together, Lorna berating her father, calling him a racist and oppressor, and Pietro is openly disgusted by his father, calling him a man who doesn't have the courage to build a true paradise and instead builds an army out of fear, a man who believes in being above humanity and yet still succumbs to his own human nature, a prisoner of his own fear. House of M is another story that details how his pain not only affected his own life, but he notes that he put his children through hell because of his beliefs, and how he was once even prepared to sacrifice them for his revenge. He once called them an acceptable loss. This is a character whose anger is complex, ranging from delusion to righteousness to confusion, a rage that is truly blinding. But very few characters see Eric's complexity, and none more than Charles Xavier. Professor X has tried to veer Magneto off that path, through countless speeches and interventions, and through actions, as he knows the man better than anyone. Charles is the only person that Magneto let into his heart after he lost his family. Charles is one of the only people who believes in Eric's goodness, so much so that he's given Magnus control of the X-Men more than once. In both New Mutants and in Age of Apocalypse, the Master of Magnetism becomes Headmaster, or Leader of the X-Men. And one of my favorite moments is in New Mutants, when he has to temper his arrogance and authority with compassion for these children, where he has to struggle and tone himself down to be a leader for these kids. When Magneto finds out that one of his students, Doug, has died, he is absolutely heartbroken when he realizes that he has to call Doug's parents and tell them that he allowed their son to die. Magneto cared for these children, for their future, but he could never fully escape that pain within him. Magneto's history is complex and complicated, and so writers have used the characters' loaded history to have him question his own legacy. In the 2014 run, he asks, Will I be remembered for what I have accomplished, or for the terrible things I've done? What legacy will I leave behind? For all my power, righteousness, my people still suffer now more than ever. But in that very story, there is one panel that represents this modern Magneto perfectly. As he asks himself these questions, there is a girl who speaks on the master of magnetism. She is afraid of the fury that has permanently scarred his face, the electricity that crackled in the air behind him. Monster, terrorist, insane, these are the words that are used to define him. But then she begins to tear up at the spectacle, and a smile shines through despite those tears. The girl says that she is glad that mutants have someone who can do the bad things, who can be angry on their behalf so that they can survive. Similarly in Fatal Attraction, when an individual sees Magneto the monster unleash his terrifying power and then watches him weep at his wife's grave, this humanizes the monster. Notes that Magneto is not a villain and he is not a monster, and he is not less than human, but instead a man who denies himself a human life in order to make the lives of others safe from the kind of pain and hardship he suffered. And Magneto goes on to spare that man, a man who once called Magneto inhuman. Magneto is a character who undergoes a decent bit of change, and the modern Krakoa era offers a new chapter in Magneto's story. The Krakoa era begins after Charles has shown that his dream never pans out across many different timelines. So along with Magneto, they decide to create something totally new. A place, a nation, that truly has all of mutant kind's existence and prosperity at the forefront. But this time, they do it with nearly every mutant on board, and one unified vision. But even Krakoa was too grand for the great idealist Charles Xavier. It becomes another one of Magneto's failures. He says that they were fools, building on sand. And in X-Men Red, he reflected on the type of man that he was. He says that there are those who see me as a monster, and I can pretend that they never knew me. But those who see me as a failure, what can I say to the truth? He asks. Another consistent theme in Magneto's story is that despite his indomitable will, he never succeeds. Failed in protecting his family. Failed in protecting his home, 
None of his lofty goals or visions ever came to fruition. He promised his daughter to jump from that burning building, and yet he failed to catch her. Everywhere he goes, those he tries to save burn. When he was a child, when he was a husband and father, when he was a king. The only thing that he's had, that he's succeeded in, was vengeance. Vengeance is the remnant of everything that he couldn't give all of those that he failed. That is the way he honors their legacy. That is the way he grieves. But over time, the question remains, what good has he done? What change has he made? What mutants has he protected? And it ultimately comes down to one final question. What good does redemption do for him? Krakoa was supposed to be that redemption. It was supposed to be the way to lessen his guilt, a way to escape from all of these failures. But when things change on Krakoa, when the future gets a bit cloudier, when Magneto finds out his first daughter, Anya, couldn't be resurrected, Magneto retires from his post on Krakoa to settle on Arako, where he and several other mutants are attacked by Arako's rival Eternals. Magneto then sacrifices himself in order to protect the mutants, the people of Arako. In a nation where mutants can be resurrected through the synergy of a bunch of different mutant abilities, Magneto still chooses death. He yearns to be reunited with his human daughter. He chose death over the dream he built with his friend. He could have stayed, he could have tried to make Krakoa better, to make their situation better, but Magneto had reached a breaking point. He had lost too much, his failures were too great. Despite all this, Magneto is still sought after in Krakoa's time of need, and Storm finds the mutant in the afterlife. Magneto is self-loathing, a man who truly despises himself, despises what he has become. A man who desired to be a god, but succumbs to his humanity time and time again. He hates himself because he isn't strong enough. So of course he is unable to forgive himself for all of his past sins. Of course he believes that he doesn't deserve to live, and that he doesn't merit a second chance. Because that'll only mean more failure for him, more loss. The mutant is confronted with all the lives he has taken, whether by his hand, his name, by his action or inaction. Those he regrets, those he doesn't, they all count, they all matter. And so in the resurrection of Magneto, he judges himself. Because who will if he doesn't? He must judge himself because he was the judge of a nation. He was once the judge of humanity. And seeing all of these names, remembering all of these people, he can't forgive himself. And finally he lands on his own name, his first name, the kid he left behind. Max Eisenhardt, who had been buried, repressed, and denied so many times. Magneto has hurt Max Eisenhardt so many times, because he couldn't withstand the guilt, the pain. Magneto ultimately chose death because he was running away from facing down the consequences of the choices he's made. That is Magneto. He deflects, he runs, and he hides. As Charles noted, Magneto has never taken responsibility. And as Magneto is bleeding from his empty, blackened eyes, Storm shows him all the people he saved. He realizes that he has killed too many to ever turn his back on people. But he also realizes that it's not too late to save another. It's not too late to save Max. It's not too late to save Charles Xavier. For all of Xavier's missteps and the harm that he has caused, again, he has always given Magneto the grace and the opportunity to see Magneto in a way that he could never see himself. We also have to take the time to appreciate Storm for her patience and most of all for her immense compassion to pull a friend in need out of the possible eternal despair that lied ahead of him. In the issue that follows, Magneto is confronted with his past self, his rage personified, perhaps the most foundational part of himself, he considers. And despite all of the vitriol that his past self is spewing, he must forgive himself. Magneto comes to a conclusion here, a realization. He can't return to the world and return to the same path. He must change, evolve. Magneto finally owns up to the man that he was, and he doesn't shun him. He owns him and he uses him. He lets his past self be the engine to drive him to a better world. A world, quote, for all who are feared and hated. And as he is resurrected, Magneto refers to himself as power. Power personified. That is Magneto. A man who's had all of the power in the world, but could not save anyone. 
Here, through his indomitable will, Magneto saves the one who saved his soul, who gave him a second chance. Magneto has so often been unable to look at himself and truly see a man. Again, he has been described a number of times as a man who has lost his soul. A man who has a fractured identity, who wears many masks, many faces, many names. When he's consoling his former self, that design of simply a helmet and white, vacant, inhuman eyes is juxtaposed with Magneto's human appearance. And especially in this panel, his hands are placed on his shadow's shoulder as that idea comes to life. It's in these chapters in The Resurrection of Magneto where he offers himself a bit of grace, a bit of forgiveness for his justified anger that has run rampant. And now he can use that rage to change, to guide him. And reborn into the world, he does precisely that. To save one person is to save the world. Magneto continues to recite this. He says that it is a line that one of his teachers taught him. It's a line that can be found in the Talmud and a similar line that can be found in the Quran. Whoever saves a single life is considered by scripture to have saved the world. As Magneto ventures towards change, one of the biggest engines for that change, yes, is his past self, but it's also Max, the boy that he left behind all those years ago. This is a man who had once abandoned his God. A man who had turned his back on God. Now, Magneto has chosen a new path. One that fuses all of the men that he once was to form a new identity, a new path. A path with Max Eisenhart at his core and a righteous fury as his engine. When you save one person, you save all the people who will live through that one person. Magneto as a character has always reverted to villainy. He's always been confused, teetering on that edge, but he is an iconic villain, always. Al Ewing, however, takes that step. He embraces the character's need for evolution, but not only for the history of the character, but for Magneto, he's always been unable to get out of his own way. A person who is unable to accept his faults, his sins. But in the resurrection of Magneto, he can finally begin to heal. He can accept that there is some good in him. There is a chance to chase that redemption he felt wasn't in the cards. Magneto doesn't become a non-killing Professor X type of hero. He remains true to what his character has always been. In the very next chapter, he's forced to kill the people oppressing mutants. He tries other routes, but ultimately is left with no choice. But he vows to remember their names. Like all the names that haunted him in the afterlife. He approaches these situations now with care and nuance. He understands that now he is hope for the hopeless. To these people, he is a good man, and he can only try and be even greater. He ends this story by going to save humans from a sentinel. Instead of a man trying to become God, a man who thought himself above the world and the people in it, Magneto has accepted his place as a man a part of this world. And so he must make this world better. This is his atonement. This is how he makes amends. And finding his faith again, reciting Jewish scriptures, and living them is a part of that journey. This is why his redemption matters. Because he is now a man who fights to craft a better world for everyone who is hated and feared. To save one person is to save the world. Magneto has become a character who fundamentally understands and is trying now to take down all systems of oppression for all the oppressed. For me, this is when Magneto is at his greatest. Al Ewing took Magneto as a character and has evolved him. He has moved him past his previous iterations. Like any character who evolves and changes for good, no matter where the future of this series lies, no matter where the future of the X-Men lies, Magneto has changed now. Claremont laid a foundation for the character and in using all of the different iterations of Magneto years later, Al Ewing has advanced and improved on that foundation. Now, never again will any oppressed people be silenced. This is the new Magneto.